Is that better? Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, the title of this talk is Hacking Headhunters. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, by bringing up the outline. Uh, these are the topics I want to cover. Um, oh, I should start by saying that I brought Tootsie Rolls. Does anybody want Tootsie Rolls? <laughs> I'll start them over here, and you guys can pass them around. Okay, so here's what we're in for. Um, the session has three goals. Uh, the first goal is to get a better understanding about what recruiters do. Uh, basically, headhunting is just as simple as you think uh, in the general terms. But if you start to look at some of the details, um, you know, some of it's a little bit more interesting than you might think at first. Um, the second goal is to examine some of the processes and tools used by headhunters. And then the third goal is to apply that knowledge in a way that uh, you can begin to hack the process or at least use the information to your advantage when you're dealing with headhunters. Um, when I started thinking about different ways you could use uh, this information to your advantage, I realized that there's different ways that people interact with headhunters, and I came up with three different ways. Um, the first way is you might be a candidate who's going to be placed by a headhunter. You might be working with a recruiter to get a new job, um, and that's probably what would be most appropriate for today's audience. Um, and so if you're working with a recruiter to get a new job, you want to do everything you can to help them. And so tips that help the headhunter do his job are going to have a, a green smile face next to them in the presentation. Uh, you might be a manager or an employee who wants to keep their employees or coworkers from getting stolen by a headhunter. And in that case, you're going to want to try to thwart them. And tips along those lines will have the red frown next to them. And um, the third way you might interact with a headhunter is to um, Perhaps you have uh, an open position that you need to staff, and you want to consider hiring one uh, to help you staff that position. And so hiring a recruiter uh, tips have the blue guy with dollar signs in his eyes. Um, and at various points in your career, you may have uh, one or two or all three of these um, different ways of interacting with headhunters uh, happening. So be looking for these icons throughout the presentation. Um, we're going to start with some definitions. And we'll start with the most basic definition, uh, what is a headhunter or a recruiter? Um, very basically, uh, these are the guys who match up candidates uh, with open positions on behalf of their clients. Uh, a company will have an open position that they have trouble filling, and so they'll call up a headhunter and um, give them the task of filling that position. Um, most often, they pre prefer to be called recruiters or search professionals. Um, the term headhunter has been around for a long time, and it's considered informal, but not necessarily pejorative these days. Um, headhunters have a pretty thick skin, and I don't think I've ever heard of one being offended by being called that. Um, next definition is a search. Uh, the search is the name for the activity that the headhunter does when he's trying to place a candidate in a client's open position. Um, uh, a search is always for a specific, well-defined position within the client company. Um, and I put some examples here, uh, Vice President of IT for a bank, Oracle DBA. Um, it's always precisely defined, and um, uh, there's a specific open position with a specific job description that they're trying to, to fill. Uh, and we'll talk about the search process in a lot more detail later on. Uh, Next is a list of the players that are involved in the search process, and I've identified four, and we've actually already hinted at the top three, I think. Um, the client is the customer company who has an open position and who has hired the recruiter to, to fill that position. And the recruiting firm is the company that, that has the headhunters on staff who are going to perform uh, the search. Um, a candidate is a potential match for that open position. Um, and this is sort of the headhunter's raw material that he's going to use to, to satisfy the client's need. And um, the hiring manager is one guy we haven't talked about yet. He's the manager at the client company who has the open position. Um, 
and he's one of the most important players in the role because he's the one that um, is pretty much going to control the process from the client side. Um, every recruiting firm is uh, is unique, but uh, this this slide represents a common way that they're organized. Um, they're organized somewhat like law firms. At the very top, you have partners or owners who are in charge of running the business. Uh, their job is to bring in new contracts, uh, to make the executive decisions, um, and so forth. And there's a small number of them who um, sort of run the business side of things. And a step down from them are the consultants. And these are the senior, uh, the senior search executives who um, do the actual work of performing a search. Um, these guys uh, usually manage a portfolio of several concurrent searches, and they're in charge of interacting with the client um, and doing some of the interviews uh, before the candidates are presented to, um, presented to the client. And then a step below them is the associates, and um, associates are sort of the junior search executives, and they do a lot of the legwork. They spend a lot of time on the phone talking to candidates, they review resumes, and they do some of the interviews themselves. And at the very bottom are uh, what, what they call researchers. And if you have an image in your mind of a researcher as someone in a lab coat with a clipboard, that's not what these guys are at all. They're basically telemarketers who are just calling into companies trying to discover names and titles. Um, typically, each search will be staffed by one consultant and one or two associates and then a few researchers. And that's the team that's going to execute a search. Like I said, every search, search firm is different, but they fall into two categories. Uh, there's retained search firms and contingency search firms. And the basic difference between them is when they get paid. A retained search firm gets paid either up front or more typically in installments during the life of the search. And a contingency search firm only gets paid at the end of the search when they've successfully placed a candidate. And although this seems like a pretty small uh, distinction, it actually has a big impact in, in terms of everything else that happens at the, at the search firm. Uh, for example, the retained search firm is going to get paid no matter what. And um, getting the search done sooner doesn't get them their money faster. So uh, they often focus on searches at the executive level, such as CEOs, CTOs, um, vice presidents, directors, board members, um, because these searches tend to take a longer time to complete. Uh, companies are very picky about their senior executives, and, and that's why it takes a long time to, to make a placement at that level. Um, so they can afford to spend the extra time to, to make that happen. Um, their practice is also very oriented around the search. Uh, for every search that they're doing, they're going to collect um, uh, a number of candidates who are qualified and find the ones that fit the search parameters best and present those to the uh, client. This is in contrast to a contingency search firm. Uh, they only get paid at the end of the search, and therefore, um, you know, the longer a search takes, the longer it is before they get their next check. Um, therefore, they have to concentrate on searches that can be completed faster, and therefore they focus more on the individual contributor level. Um, and they also have different tactics. Um, every time they find a reasonable candidate, they're not going to send it to just one client. They're going to send that guy's resume over to, you know, every client they have uh, at the moment and hope for a match as soon as possible. Uh, I should mention at this point that I spent five years as a software developer for a retained uh, executive search firm, and so most of my slides are where, where it makes a difference um, are oriented toward that type of search firm. Uh, there are very few companies that do both kinds of searches. It's, it's rare for a company to cross the line. Um, they usually stick to either one or the other. Um, so here's our first set of, of tips for working with hunters. Um, if you're hiring a, a, a search firm, uh, you want to make sure you choose the type that's appropriate for the level of search that you're doing. If you're looking for a senior executive, you may want to consider a retained search firm. Otherwise, go with a contingency firm. And if a headhunter calls you and says they have an opportunity that might fit your background, uh, try to find out what kind of search firm uh, they work for, because that's going to tell you something about their motivation and the way that uh, things are going to play out. OK. So that's the end of the definition section. Are there questions yet? Nobody? OK. Um, I'm going to move on to a few slides about the purpose uh, that recruiters serve. Um, recru there, there was a point in time um, in the business um, 
ecosystem when it was very difficult for companies to manage the hiring process themselves. Um, they didn't have a lot of resources for getting in touch with qualified candidates. Um, there was no Dice.com in the 70s, for example. Um, and uh, the tendency then was for employees to stick with a, a single company longer, in, as opposed to today where uh, changing jobs every few years is pretty typical. And that's part of the reason why recruiting firms came into existence, was to help uh, serve that need. They specialize in finding and dislodging qualified employees from companies and placing them with other companies. Um, today, um, the, the companies have more tools at their disposal in terms of finding, uh, finding talent themselves, uh, and that has put some pressure on, on the recruiting firms. Uh, even though uh, the recruiting firm is basically a middleman in between the people with the jobs and the people who need the jobs, um, and middlemen are sort of being replaced by the internet these days, uh, sometimes it's still useful to use a middleman. For one thing, uh, hiring new talent is an administrative task that uh, is not, doesn't directly contribute to a company's bottom line, and so it makes sense to outsource that task. Uh, furthermore, if you out outsource it to a recruiting firm who specializes in uh, your industry, for example, they're spending all their time you know, hiring uh, in the hiring process, so they become experts at it. They may be able to execute the search quicker, which means you spend less time with that open position uh, uh, waiting to be filled. And if you've ever tried to hire especially a technical person, you know you get a lot of applicants who are just not qualified. And sometimes it's not apparent from the resume that they're not qualified. It's not until you're interviewing them that you find out that this is a bozo. And so if you can push off dealing with the bozos to some other company, that can actually be a big benefit. Um, and the last reason uh, it's useful to use a recruiter is because you can use them as a level of indirection to protect your company's secrets. Um, for example, if you're a technical company and you're making a strategic switch from, let's say, Windows to Linux, uh, you might not want to put an ad in the paper with your company's name that says Linux developers wanted because that's going to tip off the competition uh, what you're doing. Uh, so it gives a way to provide some level of anonymity. Um, there's also such a thing as a confidential search in which the Recruiters agree not to disclose the company who's uh, actually hiring. And that's a really useful way if you really don't want, want anyone in the public to know that you're hiring for a particular position. Okay, so we have a slide here that gives a high level overview of the recruiting process. Uh, the first two steps are sort of the, the setup steps. Uh, first, the client company is going to select and, and hire a recruiting firm, and then they'll draw up a contract that specifies the position that's being sought, the level of compensation uh, for the new hire, and most importantly, which individuals from the client company and the recruiting firm are going to be involved in the search. Uh, steps three and four are where the work happens, and we have more detailed slides about those um, coming up. Basically. Uh, the recruiter works on the search until it's finished. Uh, when a suitable candidate is found, uh, they'll be offered the job at the client company and the candidate will start work. Uh, at that point, uh, we have the five, six, and seven, sort of the, the cleanup steps. Um, the client will pay the fee to the recruiter if it's a contingency firm. Uh, you'll remember that uh, a retained firm will be uh, paid up front or during, in, in installments during the search. And the fee is typically 25 to 33 percent of the candidate's base salary. Uh, for a long time, 33 percent was uh, standard and non-negotiable, but uh, uh, the dot-com crash of 2000 and the economic downturn